Hello, I'm Pastor Doyle from the church next door, and I'm excited I get to be with you again. You know, this time on Sundays has been so much fun for me to get to know you. I hope you feel like you're getting to know me. I'd love for you to connect with me online. You can go to our website, visit our social media, or of course, you can text CONNECT to 614-412-2144 or feel free to email me at connect at tcnd.org. The reason we've been meeting is, I don't know, 10, 11 weeks ago, our world was turned upside down. And we said, what can we do to encourage your faith? What can we do to inspire you? And so we've met with you right here every week just to try to give you a little bit of encouragement, a little bit of a nudge that there is good news around the corner. And we are. We're starting to open up now. We're starting to get together with friends. Today is a special day because I want to invite you to take your next step with God. But this time, I want you to grab a hold of God's hand. We've been talking about walking with God. What would it be like for you to grab a hold of God's hand? And so today we're going to talk about that. How do we take a hold of God's hand? Are there things that we need to let go of? And I want to begin by telling you a story about a dog. Boaz was this dog that my boys got me one year um, around Easter. Boaz was this little fluff of fur when he came to me. Now, this is why I love Boaz. He was one of the most faithful dogs I've ever seen. He was one of the smartest dogs I've ever had. Well, I got to this point in my relationship with God and I felt like God was saying to me, Doyle, I want you and Jennifer to move. I want you to move to downtown Columbus. But I had all this stuff and I had all these things and part of it was Boaz. I thought, how can I leave my dog that I loved? And I called a friend, my friend Bob, and I said, Bob, Would you be willing to take Boaz? He said, sure, I'd love to have Boaz. So to this day, Boaz lives with Bob and he has a great life. But I had to be willing to give up Boaz in order for me to take this next step in my relationship with God. I had to let go of one thing in order to take hold of God's hand in another way. Now, I love Boaz because Boaz reminds me of scripture. I named him Boaz because Boaz was one of the pillars in the temple of Jerusalem. Boaz was also a man in the Bible who was a redeemer of God. I love that imagery that when you and I have a relationship with God, he will redeem us. He will buy us back. So he takes our brokenness. Do you know the story of Ruth and Boaz? See, Ruth had a broken life, a hard life, a terrible life. And Boaz steps into her life and he gives her a new future. But she had to be willing to yield to that. She had to leave her home, her family and everything in order to take hold of God's plan for her life. I love this verse from Ruth, chapter one, verse 16. It says, she looks at her mother-in-law and she says, don't urge me to leave you. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. That means that, that Ruth had to be willing to walk away from her past and walk away in order to take a hold of God's hand. There's this another powerful passage in the life of Jesus and the disciples. And he's he's training them. He's teaching them about the kingdom of God and the way it's going to be to follow him. Sitting down, Jesus called the 12 and said, anyone who wants to be first must be very last and the servant of all. So what Jesus says is for you and I to be great, we have to be willing to give up our will for his will. We have to be willing to say, okay, God, what is it that you're doing in my life? God, could you show me what you're doing in my life? We have a great story today. A friend of ours is Kim Bevan from right here at the church next door. Jennifer's going to interview her, listen to her story about how she had to learn to recognize God in the midst of her life. It's a privilege to have Kim Bevan with us here today. So Kim, tell us, how did you come to know the Lord? Well, I was a lucky kid. My mom was in an, um, on a home where we were living in Springfield. And luckily there were some ladies that were doing some home to home visits and they stopped by the house and invited her to church. And that very next Sunday, she piled all four of us kids in the station wagon and off we went. And from there, that's where I got my, my, my basics, my grounding, where I was baptized. And um, I was lucky to have that Christian home to grow up in such a gift, isn't Mm -hmm. it? It was. And so now you're married to a man named Bill. So Mm -hmm. how did you and Bill 
get together? Well, the first time or the second time? Either one. <laughs> the first time we got together, we met while we were working. Um, we were working in a prison together and we got married, um, had Paige. Um, before that, I was married and had Bailey, or Brittany really quickly. Um, that lasted a very short period of time. But then Bill and I got together and we had Paige. Um, but we weren't living in a Christian home. I had fallen kind of away and we weren't doing things that we needed to be doing to help each other or do the things we needed to do in marriage. So we ended up getting divorced and I moved back closer to home to be near my mom. And by that time my dad had passed. And it took a lot of soul searching for me to get um, straight with God again and to surrender a lot of things because I was in control and wanted to stay in control of every little thing. But I found out that once I moved back home and started to look for a church and look for a place to go to get back to that spiritual being that I was before, um, that I was lucky enough to find the church next door. So while I was here, um, there was a, an occasion that Bill was at home, Paige was back and forth between the two of us, and he was going to be alone at Christmas. And I said, why don't you just come up here and hang out with Paige and I, and, and um, we can go to church. And he goes, if you ask me, I'll go. And I said, I'm asking you, do you want to go? <laughs> so he did, and he liked it. And then over a few months and stuff, we kept talking, and then we decided, you know, there were some things that we could really work out. So we did. Um, he decided to invite the Lord into his heart, and it, it was kind of amazing that he brought us back together. But it wasn't for a reason that we knew at the time, but now that we look back on it, it was a reason that we were, we were put back together again for a second time. And God was working in that. So now we have, you know, each other, and, and we have Bailey, and it's just, it's just been, it's been good. You are a grandma mm -hmm. raising Bailey. Mm -hmm. How have you had to give up your, you know, the sacrifices you've had to make time, energy, resources, and how has God led you to come to this point? Well, God's had to give me the energy. God's had to give the energy to Bill. Um, and because of that, you know, we've been able to um, keep up with her school, to keep up with her activities. We like to keep her busy. And since she's really the only child in a grandparent home, there's a lot of things that we like to keep and do with her. And she's just a, such a good kid. She was put there for a reason. Absolutely. Yep. I'm sure there are others out there who've also are raising a grandchild. What, what suggestions would you have for them? You have to pray. You have to have God lead you in what you're going to do, whether it's through, you know, getting the child through the court system, through the family services system. Um, but you need to pray. You need to have God lead you. Um, he will answer you. He will always give you a sign of something that He will tell you in your heart what you need to do. And there's going to be a lot of sleepless nights, and there's going to be a lot of crying, and there's going to be a lot of pain with it. And I think that when God tells you, I need you to do this and I need you to step up, then you should listen and pay attention because you're gonna get the blessing and the benefit from it. What do you think God's really spoken to you through this? The surrender, the giving up of control, because for me, that's been so hard. All these years, it's been hard. I wanted to be the one in charge and it doesn't work that way. God doesn't want you to be in charge. God wants you to follow Him, and God wants you to lean on Him. Because God didn't create us to depend on ourselves. God created us to depend on Him. And if we put Him first, then all the blessings will come with it. And God always leads us on a good path. I can feel all the love that you have for your family and for the community and each other. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful thing. It is, it's great, it's wonderful. Thank you so much, Kim. Thanks. I love Kim, Bill, and Bailey. They have a great testimony of what happens when a family comes around God and takes a hold of Him. I used to struggle with this idea of surrender because I didn't like the idea of surrender. I'm one of three boys, okay? And so I was crone in this environment where you competed and you fought and you tried to win. But as I grew up, I learned something. My elder brother, Alan, was a great basketball player. Now he was seven years older than me, so I was a little pipsqueak. He would tell me, Doyle, 
If you'll be on my team and do exactly what I say, we'll win every time. I said, okay, I'm cool with that. I like winning. He'd say, okay, Doyle, I'm going to pass you the ball. You stand right there and then you pass it back to me. I'm going to run this guy into you. Whatever you do, don't flinch. It's going to be okay. And then we're going to score. And that's what we did. I was my brother's screen. I just stood there and got run into all day long, but we won a lot of basketball games. Well, sometimes it feels like that when you're yielding to God, you feel like you're taking punishment, but at the same time, you're winning. See, it hurts to give up your will. It hurts to give up your way. I have this friend, someone I really, really love, all right? They grew up in another part of the world and they had a rough, rough, childhood. I mean, it was painful, the abuse that they went through. And this person became a fighter. Fighting is how they won. Fighting is how they got here. Fighting is how they survived. I remember sitting across the table from this friend one day and I said, listen, man, I love you and you're a fighter and it's gotten you a long way. But on this one, you've got to stop fighting. He looks at me and says, I don't think I know how not to fight. I said, well, you better figure this one out because you're about to lose your job and you're about to lose your marriage and you're about to lose your kids because you've never learned that sometimes you've got to let go of some things in order to have the relationship. See, we're talking about walking with God and having a relationship with God. And the only way you can really take a hold of God's hand is if you let go of some of the stuff in your hand. You cannot hang on to all your stuff. That means emotional stuff as well as physical stuff. You can't hang on to the past. You can't hang on to bitterness and unforgiveness and resentment and rejection. You have to be willing to say, Jesus, would you heal that brokenness in me? I'm going to give you my brokenness and you give me healing. Dogs, dogs like Boaz, these phenomenal Malinois, they have the ability to, to smell cancer. They can smell if somebody has uh, diabetes and their blood sugar level is dropping. There's a man in the Bible by the name of Caleb. And Caleb was the one that was leading the people to go into the land. He and Joshua, they go in and they see the land, the Bible says, and everybody else says, we can't do it. But Caleb says, no way, we can do it. Do you know what Caleb means in Hebrew? It means dog. I believe that reason that Caleb is called Caleb in the Bible was because he had a sense. He had a sense of faith. It was like a dog's nose. He could recognize God in the midst of a five acre field and he would not give up on God moving in his life. And I want you to abandon your lack of faith. I want you to abandon your fear. I want you to set aside those things that have overwhelmed you in this season and say, no, I'm going to let go of my fear and I'm going to take hold of trust and I'm going to take hold of God's hand. Now, before we go on, Jennifer's got a story for you that will really encourage your faith and trust in God. Webster's definition of surrender is an action verb, to give oneself up to the possession or power of another to submit. But surrender is a defining style of the transformed Christian. God says the way up is down. The world says the way up is to climb, promote, bigger, better, self-effort. But God says the way up is down on your knees in prayer and with a heart for Him. It feels a lot like giving up, but in reality, when you relinquish your life or an area of your life to God, you are gaining ground. Let's read Psalm 1824. I've kept my integrity by surrendering to Him. And so the Lord has rewarded me with His blessing. You know, one time we adopted a beautiful boxer dog and brought her home on 4th of July and named her Betsy Ross after the famous American flag maker. Betsy was a dog like no other and we had her for many years. And when she died, we had a little family funeral for her. And right in that moment, God spoke to me from Isaiah 43. It says, now I'm doing a new thing. It springs up. Do you not perceive it? 
Even the animals honor me. God put that in my heart and He had my attention. He had taught me so much about loyalty and love through this pet. <laughs> but now in this grief, I had to give up Betsy and I had to yield the relationship to believe that God wanted to do something new in my life. God has all of our attention now through staying home. But are we listening? Are we willing to change? So what does giving up look like? How do we walk it out? Well, first, we have to take an inventory of our lives and we start giving our lives back to God piece by piece. We yield to God. So first, I want you to give your whole heart to God and invite Jesus in. Second, give God your ways, such as your mouth, your relationships, and your dreams. And third, give God your resources of your time, money, and energy. Romans 12, one to two, beloved friends, what should be our proper response to God's marvelous mercies? I encourage you to surrender yourselves to God and to be His sacred, living sacrifices. Don't you just love the roundabouts in Columbus? But the key to roundabouts is yielding, looking, waiting, and then going, go, go. It's the same with relinquishment. Once you have given God your heart, then give God your will. This is the most productive thing you could ever do spiritually. It's the hardest, but if you do, you will seldom lose your peace. Psalm 72, six says, your favor will fall like rain on our surrendered lives, like showers reviving the earth. Sometimes our sacrifice is our mouth and the goal is to be quiet and to wait on God in prayer. Perhaps you've been criticizing someone you're supposed to love, or maybe your criticism is correct, but you need to be still and give God room to work in their life and situation. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33, to seek first the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. And then he will give you everything you need. Surrender looks a lot like this. My time is his time. My resources are his resources. My future is in his hands. I decided to leave my worry with God and said, God, I give it back to you right now. I just choose to stop worrying. His peace came into my heart and it'll come into your heart too. Look at Psalm 46:10. Surrender your anxiety. Be silent and stop your striving and then you will see that I am God. So I would like to pray for you to release your lives to Him. Dear God, I pray that you would show us the areas that you want us to release. We surrender our time, our resources. We give you our mouths, our words, the criticisms, our, our feelings and emotions of fear and anxiety. We, we hand them over to you today. And God, we're asking that you would move in our lives, that you would transform us, and that you would take these areas as a gift to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. I love Jennifer. She's so good, isn't she? She really breaks it down. In that illustration of the roundabout, I love that. In order for you to get moving, you've got to be willing to yield with the traffic in your life. And you need to know that God is in that. God is in the midst of this world. I believe the reason this pandemic, this COVID virus has been good is it's forced us to yield to God. It's forced us to evaluate what's most important in our life. It's forced us to really look at that. You know, there's a powerful story in the life of King David. He was forced to evaluate what was most important in his life. He becomes king and he's been king for years. And then one day he's sitting on his throne and his very own son, Absalom, decides to declare himself king. Absalom is trying to take the kingdom from his dad. And in, in, in 2 Samuel 15, it says that, that David walked out of the city weeping. I was in Jerusalem a couple years ago and I was, I was reading this passage and I went down to the, to the same place. It tells us that at the bottom of the hill, it's where the Garden of Gethsemane is. It's the same place where Jesus relinquished his will to God. In that same garden, Jesus sat there and he said, God, not my will, but your will be done. David had that same prayer a thousand years before Jesus. He says in 2 Samuel 15, God, if I found favor in your eyes, you will bring me back to this place that I might worship you again. But if not, that's okay. 
Hmm. David said, this kingdom, it's not mine. I may be called the king of Judah. I may be called the king of Israel, but it's really your kingdom, God. It's, it's your kingdom. And if, if you want to bring me back, then I'll come back. But if not, that's okay. See, that's at the core of relinquishment. It's, it's at the core of yielding to God. It's at the core of this tension in your life and my life that wants to be in control. And God is asking you, if you're going to walk with me, I'm going to choose the path. You get to follow me. There's one more story I want to tell you. And it's a story I really love. It's, it's really important to me because uh, this weekend is Pentecost. It's the story of William Seymour. I don't know if you know this guy. In 1902, William Seymour is in this rented room in Cincinnati, Ohio. Now he is the son of two people, a man and woman that were slaves. After the Civil War, he makes his way north and he comes to Cincinnati to go to Bible school. But at that time, smallpox is going across our nation. In the midst of loving God, he gets smallpox. And as the fever rises and he's wa walking through this, this process of this disease, 14 days, the smallpox come out on him. He's itchy, he's uncomfortable, he's got a fever. One of his eyes begins to glaze over. The smallpox is taking the sight in one of his eyes. And the history records that during that time, he prayed and he said, God, I'm, I'm just trusting you for my life. I'm trusting you for everything. And it was in the midst of that prayer in that time of him releasing his life to God, he realized that God's grace was enough for him and that he was fully saved, fully clean, that there was nothing wrong in his life. He made his way from there to Texas and then ultimately to California. And he becomes the leader of one of America's greatest revival, the Azusa Street Revival. It hit in 1904, two years after this event in Cincinnati. Literally thousands upon thousands and today millions upon millions of people call themselves followers of Jesus Christ because of a movement that William Seymour led at Azusa Street. 1920, William Seymour spoke for the last time outside of Azusa Street. He was here in Columbus, Ohio, and he shared about the power of God and following his Holy Spirit and believing God for your life. Yield to the Holy Spirit of God. Let God lead you. Say, God, I want to welcome you into my life. There's lots of wonderful godly men and women leading the body of Christ in Central Ohio. And today I want to share with you Pastor Johnny Amos. How did you end up a pastor and how did you end up leading Shiloh Christian Center? First of all, I grew up as a PK. A PK is a preacher's kid. At 19 years old, the Lord, I went to church with a girl, which is now my wife. She asked me to go to church with her and I went to church with her. and and I accepted Jesus Christ into my life uh, at 19 years old. And from that, I started studying about God and becoming a minister and a pastor. Wow, what a great decision. A great decision to follow her and then to follow Jesus, man. Way to go. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a great, one of the great two best decisions I made in my life. Well, I love the story about uh, Shiloh and, and your building. So tell me a little bit about how you ended up in that place. Well, um, I was uh, looking for um, a place and uh, I was led there to uh, 787 East Broad Street and I, I couldn't believe that it was still available. The finances came uh, through a lady, which is very interesting. Uh, we got in contract with the building and a lady, uh, we were in prayer and a lady came to the play church and she gave us $100,000 saying that the Lord sent her to us to, um, to give us this finances to get the building. And it was just incredible. That's how we purchased uh, 780 70s Broad Street. What has God um, led you to do during this season when everybody's been afraid and, and all the things that are going on in the world around us, how have you guys responded? Uh, we have a group called Street Soldiers. And our Street Soldiers group, uh, every Tuesday, we go out into the streets, we go hit, uh, go into hospitals and pray for the sick. 
Uh, we have m many stories about how people were, were healed by the power of the Lord through prayer. Uh, when COVID-19 happened, uh, Grand Hospital, OSU, uh, some of those hospitals stopped us from coming in. A few weeks after this restriction uh, and in prayer, uh, the Lord birthed an idea in our head. And the idea was, uh, if you can't get to them, they can get to you through a, uh, a prayer hotline. Since then, every piece came together really fast. <laughs> And so today we have a operating prayer line. Uh, the number is 833-722-9496 or 833-PRAY-FOR-YOU. Thank you for bringing other churches together to help you minister to people in this time. That's what Central Ohio needs. Thank you, Johnny, for doing that. That's awesome. We'll do this while we're talking about prayer. Would you just take a moment and, and pray for Central Ohio right now? Yes, I'd be honored to, thank you. So Father, we pray today that you would allow those who are hurting, that need help, that you would touch them, that you would strengthen them. And we also pray today that the church of Jesus Christ will arise to this call, will arise to this hour and be one in you, Father. So Father, I thank you. You said that, well, that we're brethren dwell together in unity, that you will command a blessing. Cause us to come together because we need the blessing of you. We repent from our ways and we turn to you. And you said if we will do that, that you will heal our land. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Johnny, thank you so much. Well, thank you, Thanks Doyle. for being here. I love Pastor Johnny. He has been such an inspiration and encouragement to me. And I wanna challenge you, you should consider signing up. Call his number. He's got a great team, they'll pray with you right now. I'm glad we've had this time together, but I wanna ask you this. Is there something that you want to relinquish to God today? Maybe there's a bad habit. Maybe there's an idea that you've thought about yourself. Maybe there's an idea in your head an idea that you're not valuable, something like that, that you need to let go of. If it's a habit or if it's a, in any way, there's something that God has prompted you to let go of. I wanna invite you just to say this prayer with me right now. Heavenly Father, I release to you my life and I let go of all my bad habits and all these ideas that have held me back so that I might follow you. And I thank you for Jesus, that he would die for me. I've told you about this before. If you'll just text free book to our number, 614-412-2144, I would like to give you a copy of my brother's book about intentional faith. I wanna give this to you as a gift, while copies last, to encourage your faith in God and following Him. I'm so glad we've had this time together. You know, next week we've got a special lesson just for you. I've got another pastor friend that's gonna be here, but next week we're gonna talk about the mirror and how God has given us a way to make adjustments in our life so that we can have a better relationship with Him, so we can walk with Him. So please connect with me on social media, check in with me on my website, and as always, text connect to be a part. Remember, I'm Pastor Doyle, your friend from the church next door. I love you.